I'm sitting aboard a World War II torpedo that is just a preview of one of the many fascinating things you'll find inside the LA Maritime Museum. So come with me as we explore this really interesting museum. Talking with Mary Frances Trevelli, the director of the Maritime Museum in San Pedro. First of all, tell us a little bit about the museum. The museum is 31 years old. We opened in 1980 in a very interesting building that was actually built as the municipal ferry terminal back in 1941. So we had people from all walks of life accessing this building really around the clock in order to get from here to Terminal Island. And at that time, Terminal Island was the home of really bustling canneries and shipyards and naval installations. And it was also a great way to get to Long Beach if you did not have a car. I understand that uh, my research tells me you've made some major changes. And the major changes reflect what? Uh, the museum in the past few years has focused its exhibits and programming on the history of Los Angeles Harbor. And of course, one of the biggest industries in that harbor was the fishing and the canning industry. So we're standing in the middle of an exhibit called Caught, Canned, and Eaten. Called what? Caught, Canned, and Eaten. <laughs> Basically, what happens to the fish. And it's a history of the fishing fleets and the fishermen and the cannery workers and the impact not only in San Pedro, but all around the world as all of this fish was packed and shipped internationally. <laughs> I'm really not into machines, but this looks absolutely intriguing. <laughs> what exactly is it? That is a Hicks engine. It represents the engines that powered some of the early 20th century fishing boats. It was called a one-lugger because it had one cylinder. What a wonderful name, a one-lugger. <laughs> I see an intriguing, I guess, thing here, and it says fish smell. <laughs> what exactly is that? Okay, that's a very important part of our fishing and canning history. When we built this exhibit and we asked the former fishermen and cannery workers what was one of the sharpest memories, they all said the smell, that the smell of fish would permeate Terminal Island. And so we tried to recreate that with a smell box. I see what looks to me like a nurse's uniform, and obviously we're not in a hospital. What exactly is that? Well, you're correct that it is a nurse's uniform, and this was a uniform worn by a cannery worker. All of the cannery workers wore nurse's uniforms because management felt that it portrayed a very clean, healthy environment in which the fish were packed. And so What sort of year was that? Okay, this uniform came from the 1920s and it was worn by a young woman named Domenica Lavarini. She was known as Minnie. She came to San Pedro at age 15 from Italy with her family, and she worked at the French Sardine Company, which was later known as Starkist, until she got married. And I take it it doesn't smell? The, no, the uniform doesn't <laughs> smell. It had been kept very well, but you can see it shows some wear. Yeah. And then we have a formal picture of the family right next to it. So at only 15 years old, she was already working in the cannery. This sign that we're looking at now is something that uh, I'm sure everybody will recognize, but for those that don't know it, what is it? This is the actual neon sign from Canetti's Seafood Grotto in San Pedro. Uh, the sign has been here in the harbor since about 1949. Wow. And Canetti's closed in January of 2010. Canetti's was really the meeting place for a lot of people who worked on the waterfront. So longshoremen and fishermen and all the locals, if you went to Canetti's for breakfast or lunch, or sometimes dinner, you'd really get caught up on the news of the day. And was this like a special table you ordered like number one or 15 or something? Well, this was known as table one because a lot of the regulars always sat there. All of these trophies were won by fishermen who entered their boats in the annual Fisherman's Fiesta. And there is a video running there, and that tells everybody what? Right. These are silent films, home movies from the 40s and 50s. And basically, you had a blessing of the fleet, and then a parade of all of these decorated boats. This one has a live donkey on it. 
So the blessing of the fleet really was a big event. It was huge. It's been compared to the Rose Parade, just on water. We would have over 200,000 people here in the harbor, uh, the fishermen's families on the boat, all celebrating and hoping for a successful year. And it takes place every year? It no longer takes place, oh. actually. Um, this festival really had its heyday in the 1950s and 60s. Okay. I feel like saying full ahead stern as I'm pushing this uh, thing here that says full stern and, and forward. And I'm standing on, what is this? This is a recreation of the flying bridge from the cruiser USS Los Angeles, CA-135. For people that don't know, uh, flying bridge, I mean, <laughs> that's nothing to do with an airplane. What does that mean? It was a secondary um, area from which you could navigate the ship. In, in case the pilot house had been taken out, um, you would have these controls handy. Uh, the Los Angeles was built because the people of Los Angeles purchased bonds in the 1940s, and they purchased enough to fund the construction of a cruiser named for their city. Oh. For people watching this, you may see that in the background there is a classic tug, but this has no connection to what we're standing on. No, the tug is actually um, an operating tugboat. It's our museum flagship. It's called the Angel's Gate was built in 1944 for the Army and served at the port of embarkation in Wilmington and then came here to the harbor, worked until 1992, and has been our museum educational boat ever since. We're standing in uh, a room that is basically filled mm -hmm. with wonderful, wonderful ship models of, I guess, mostly uh, U.S. Navy ships. Right. Uh, you have a lot of uh, Navy ships, but how many do you have? At uh, one time, we had about 70 on display, but we do mm. rotate them. And most of the models in here, again, had a connection to Los Angeles Harbor. And as you know, the Pacific Fleet was stationed here right up until 1940. From 1919 to 1940, the Navy was very much part of the daily life in the harbor. To make one of these models, and they all look absolutely brilliant and very uh, detailed, is it quite expensive to build one of these? Well, you have to look at expense in terms of the time it takes the model builder. If it's a scratch built, which means they didn't buy it prefabricated, it's really a labor of love. It can be years. Years? Yes. So we're very fortunate to have a lot of retired model builders through the years who have donated their skills. This is a model of a very famous crane that was at the Long Beach Naval Shipyard for many a years. A famous crane? A famous crane. <laughs> Um, called Herman the German, and it was a war reparation. It came to the Long Beach Naval Yard. And this model shows the crane lifting the spruce goose. Was this, when you say Her <laughs> Herman the German, I take it the crane was built in Germany? Yes, and it was a war prize after World War II. The oh. United States got a very nice crane. Um, the crane right now is in Panama because the Long Beach Naval Shipyard has closed, and the airplane here, the spruce goose, is at a Howard Hughes Museum in Oregon. We're standing by an absolutely incredibly detailed and uh, to my way of thinking a very large, uh, is this a model? This is a model. It's not an actual operating sailing vessel, it's a model. It's 12 feet long, it's called the Tradition and it was actually built by a sailor named Cedric Windus in his garage in Hermosa <laughs> Beach, California. It was bigger than his garage. That's absolutely incredible. Has it, I mean, is it able to go in the water? We've never had it in the water. It was actually designed to teach the Sea Scouts about knot tying and the parts of a ship. And it's called tradition because it looks very much like what Richard Henry Dana would have sailed on when he arrived here in the 1840s. For local historians, I see we have uh, three wonderful ships uh, dedicated to the service to Catalina. That's right. This is our very own miniature Catalina fleet. We have the Cabrillo, the Avalon, and of course the Catalina. And they were all built for us by a gentleman named Clarence Harrison, whose father was an engineer on these boats, and he literally grew up on the Catalina ferries. And these three ships operated between San Pedro and Catalina? Actually from Wilmington mm -hmm. to Catalina, yes. This is probably my, my British sense of humor, but this is not an eye test. What, what exactly no, is that? It's not. This is a lighthouse lens. Specifically, this is the original lens from the Angel's Gate Lighthouse, 
which is at the end of the breakwater here in the harbor. And this lens operated from 1913 until 1987. And they took it down because? Automation, and they had a plastic mm -hmm. lens, which is now, of course, the normal type of lens that is used in most lighthouses today. So mm -hmm. definitely now a beautiful artifact. This diving suit that we're looking at reminds me of uh, my youth, which was about 300 years ago, but <laughs> never mind that, notwithstanding. Uh, when you think about diving suits today with all the sort of rubber attachments and this and that and the other, this looks like something out of like 1930. What exactly is it? You know, actually, this is a dress for a hard hat diver, which means this person is not a scuba diver. He's really an underwater construction worker. And... This gear is used today as well. So that's always surprising to our visitors. Mm -hmm. The other comment we hear quite a bit is, oh, look how tall people were back then. Um, <laughs> actually, the suit would be filled with air, which you manipulate in order to control whether or not you're floating up towards the surface or you're descending. So actually, a normal-sized human would be using this suit. We're standing by an absolutely enormous model of what, to me, is a replica of the Queen Mary. Well, that's correct, um, but it is actually the studio model that was used in the original Poseidon Adventure movie. This model is 21 and a half feet long, took 15 men three months to build it. Wow. Um, did the studio give this to the museum? How did it come to be here? Um, as you know, in the course of the movie, this model uh, flips upside down and is broken in half and swamped, and it was repaired and brought here to the museum. It is actually our longest-term loan from Fox Studios. It's on loan? It's a loan. So, but they haven't called it in yet. No, they do check every once in a while to make sure it's still here. Oh, and we tell them, yes, we are enjoying it very much. I'm assuming since uh, we live in Los Angeles, this is... Uh, a very interesting exhibit for people who come here. Yes, we get a lot of cruise ship passengers who ask, is this the Queen Mary? <laughs> and then we explain it was built exactly on her lines. Did I hear you say that it was broken in half, this model? Yes. Uh, the model, of course, was representing the Poseidon in the movie. So anything that happened to the Poseidon happened to this model. Hmm. So broken in half, turned upside down, flooded, and then, of course, repaired by the studio in order to go on loan. The magic of movie making. What a fascinating tour this has been. Uh, what about your website and phone number and opening hours and admission prices and all that? Okay, well, it's very easy to remember. We're open every day except Monday, 10 to 5. Um, we are found on the internet at lamaritimemuseum.org. Our phone number is 310-548-7618. We do not charge for school groups to tour the museum. This is, if I may just add, an absolutely intriguing museum and absolutely well worth a visit. Mm -hmm.